I might think. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Michael Daly with the Real One Percent Podcast. Today we got a special veteran guest, another airman. My man Brett was. Uh, I met him over in Africa, AB two hundred one in Niger, not Nigeria, folks. Get on the map and look if you if you think I'm pronouncing it wrong. Uh, he was a member of Red Horse. He joined the Air Force 2015 and served for a total of six years. He specialized in pavement and construction uh, and uh, equipment during his military service. He transitioned from the Air Force to Lennar Homes as a construction manager, and he, uh, he also pr pursued flight school with uh, military benefits, so we'll have to dive into that as well. Now he's selling roofs, 1099 employee. He said he doesn't really miss the formations or the PT, which is all too familiar, and people usually don't miss that part of it. And he also receives disability support, which provides a lot of flexibility in uh, supporting his family and his lifestyle. So without further ado, Brett, how you living today, bro? Thanks for joining me on the show. Doing good, man. Appreciate you having me. No problem, dude. So, uh, you know, what prompted you to join the Air Force? Was this a lifelong uh, adventure that you wanted to, to partake in or something that you just stumbled across? Yeah, so um, I ended up joining when I was 25 and I kind of didn't know what I was doing. Um, like once I graduated high school, I did valet for years while going to community college, you know, not coming out with a degree, just partying and uh i'm like well this ain't the school thing ain't really working out right now so um i got a couple of, like sales jobs before that and then it just kind of wasn't really working out i did car sales and i was like eh, i don't know i need to do something different get out of town and um one of my buddy's dads like came in to look at a car and i was talking to him and then he was just kind of like bsing with me about you know oh, join the military blah 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 and then i kind of just looked into it my dad was in the air force my grandpa was in the navy and i'm like eh, let's see what i can do and um so i made the decision at 24 to go in and i actually tried out for uh, one of the spec ops jobs for a combat controller and um i mean i thought that would be the cool thing to do and but uh that training's no joke i washed out and then they put me in uh the pavement construction equipment so the dirt boys as we're called the dirt boys, the red hat, yeah, red horse. The red, hey, what uh, how was valet and dude? I mean, some people seem to make a lot of money. Like, what town were you yeah. doing that? Where were I you mean, at? so I was down in Tampa at the Sheridan Riverwalk. So I mean, okay. it was. I mean, it's good for obviously a college job or whatever. But I mean, I was working with guys that you know they're. 35 34 at the time and that was like kind of their career i was like yeah i don't i don't think i can do all this you know um nah, i mean nah. i've driven like every car imaginable back then so i mean that's best cool. one you had? um i mean i've driven bentley's rolls royce lambos ferraris i mean i've driven a delorean garbage yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it would stick and didn't have a uh, power steering so you're over here trying to shift and like yanking on the wheel to try to turn it in the spot but um what was it i mean i've asked the martin db7s i mean anything you name it yeah, but, James Bond, dude. yeah i know so your, your dad and your grandpa never try to really pressure you into joining the military when you were younger you just did your own thing yeah Yep, they uh, kind of just did whatever. Never really even uh, talked to them that much about about it, to be honest. Like, didn't really know any of their stories. And then, like, talked to my dad. He was like, yeah, you know, it's not bad to join. Uh, I think he was a uh, he was a mechanic on F-16. So I think he was stationed over in Korea and then ended up at McDill. And that's where I was born, obviously. So, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, they never really were directed me to go that way. And I kind of just made the decision on my own that might be something interesting to do. Yeah. Not big deal. Not a bad place to land anyways for anybody yeah. really right on the beach and everything chilling. What was, uh, so like, what was the hardest part of that spec op school? Um, excuse me if I'm wrong. So you got the PJs, right? That, that are the yeah, parent jumpers that are in the air force. And then what, what, what was your, the one that you went for? What did they specialize in? Uh, so combat controller. Yeah. So they're like uh, air traffic yeah. beat or air traffic control, but battlefield. I don't know. Okay. Apparently that's supposedly the one that's, more comparable to seals but okay 
Um, How was the tra- what was the hardest part about that training, dude? Uh, it was just a mental game. Obviously, they try to beat you down as best as possible physically and get in your head and whatnot. But I um, obviously I tried training what I could before going in and trying to do rucks and whatever. But if you know, Tampa's flat as shit. So <laughs> you go to San Antonio and you're climbing up these like mountains to me, you know, and I was just, I was struggling and, um, I, I just, I was way in the back. I wasn't really keeping up, uh, which I'm pretty physically fit. I mean, I played sports all my life, you know, I yeah. worked out, did everything. And then like towards the end, I was like coughing up blood and stuff. And I'm like, I don't think this is good. And, uh, so then I went and saw the doctor and they're like, yeah, you probably just stressed out a little bit, whatever. It ain't too much. And everybody else is still running. I'm still in the truck. And they're like, well, do you want to go out there? Or do you want to like get reclassed or take them back another week? And I was like, well, they're out there running. It's not fair that I'm not they're like, I'm just sitting in the truck and I, I just, my body couldn't do it. So I just tapped out and that was it. Meanwhile, they make you a dirt boy where you're going to get physically exerted yeah. and everything like that. You probably didn't know that at first, but no, no, no. the transition to do that? Like, how did you even get that? You just go pretty much needs to the Air Force at that point. Like once you walk. Yeah, like, so, out and say, yeah. So what they tell you is like, hey, here's a list of six jobs or list six jobs that you qualify for. And I had pretty good scores on my ASVAB. So, you know, I was trying to do something maybe like Intel or, you know, something that you could use more so on the way out like on the outside, you know, making more money and stuff. And yeah. uh, so I listed six jobs or, I mean, I tried to be like a refueler, like something cool kind of thing too. Um, and uh, yeah, then they're like, yeah, we're just going to put you in the needs of the air force. And here you go. Here's the second lowest uh, career field for ASVAB score. Here you go. I'm like, Oh, what's the, fantastic. what's the first is it is the first one security God. forces. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah, dude. That's the whole 80% of the Air Force security forces. Holy shit. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so I mean, I, I guess it could have been worse if I was a cop kind of thing, but I don't know. It, Maybe. Yeah, I, don't I don't know, know man. You could have been chilling. I mean, you know, we did. We we met each other. We met each other in Africa, and you guys yeah. used to work your asses off. Security forces used to work yeah. too, but like they'd be more. They'd be more. You know, put your yeah. gear on and go sit at the east. Controlling and, and going on. making sure yeah. the right people are coming on the base and stuff. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's definitely not as strenuous on the body. That's for sure. Right, you're not bending over all day pouring concrete or asphalt or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so did it, did you have a plan of leaving the air force? Even like when you joined, did you say, you know what, I'm just going to go do a couple years, like one contract and I'm going to bounce out and, and do something. Cause you already were saying like you were looking for a job that you could possibly like use better on the civilian side or what was your take on like, you know, time that you wanted to spend in the military? No. So, um, I was actually going to plan on doing 20 years, um, obviously looking at retirement and benefits and everything like that. I mean, you do 20 years. I mean, even going in at 25, you know, I'd be done. I'd be retired by 45 and not a lot of people could say they could do that, you know? And, um, but obviously the job that I have had, um, I wasn't too big of a fan of it. I mean, I was good at it because like, I'm typically pretty good at everything that I'm taught or whatever. Um, yeah. But I just wasn't a big fan of that. Um, and going in, uh, I married my wife, like, well, we were already engaged, like previously going into basic and then we got married at basic. So we eloped there and we thought that we would have her daughter the entire time. And that didn't happen. So we ended up only being able to get her for every summer and then every other uh, winter and Thanksgiving kind of thing. And uh, my first base was in England. So like oh, we're yeah. super far away. We have, I had to pay for all the travel and just, I know it's taking a toll on my wife. So at that point, that's kind of what made me also like switch to, well, Hey, let me either, cross train and get to a job where I could be closer to them at, at McDill because you know, the dad lived in the, the area 
um, yeah. or I was going to get out. So I was going to cross train. Um, I had everything ready. And then actually kind of after the, that deployment, I kind of made my decision like, Hey, uh, maybe I'm better off on the outside, get home, take care of the family business. So, okay. How was England for you? And like, how was your job in England compared to like, you know, what you had when you went to Africa? Yeah. So it's definitely different being Bay CE and red horse. Um, yeah, so okay. base CE, obviously you're just kind of taking over every little thing on the base. You know, if there's any issues down trees, I mean, you're kind of doing everything there. Um, whereas red horse, you're pretty much there to go either TDY or deploy. Like that's kind of the only time you really work. If not, then you're kind of just training, getting ready to deploy or go TDY. But, um, England was cool. Um, it was cool to work with the British civilians and stuff. They were all a bunch of old guys that, you know, worked hard, which is kind of different than a lot of the people in the career field sometimes too. Like, um, it, and that's another thing that kind of sucks is like, not everyone pulls their own weight. They kind of just, you have to pull the weight for other people. And that's something I'm not a, a big fan of. Um, obviously I can, but I'd rather work as a team. Um, yeah, so absolutely. working with, I'd rather work with the civilians all day or a couple of the individuals that, that were there. And, uh, but I mean, the culture over there is completely different. Um, I loved it. The only thing that sucked was the weather and British pub food. Not good. Zero flavor. Um, no, bangers and, no bangers and mash, bro. I mean, that was, I mean, that was probably the best thing there, the best thing. but <laughs> Other than that, but all the other food, like from everywhere else, like the Italian food, the Chinese food, the Thai food is all phenomenal over there. Yeah. But I mean, the beer, the beer's good though, right? The beer is I mean, good, I like the know. beer and you can drink it. It's kind of, it's called a cask ale. So it's not like cold and it's still not right. bad, you know, but um, now we love being over there, being able to travel over there for cheap. You can get flights to anywhere in Europe for like 15 bucks. It's insane. Ryanair. <laughs> yep. Try to let them know, man. Get that passport yeah. stamp. It's it's crazy, dude. You go inner inner country, like over or or you go international, I guess. To get over yep. there. Then once you're there, you just go everywhere for thirty bucks, yep. fifty bucks. Exactly. You know, get on the get on the uh, get on the train, get the rail yep. pass, and just make it happen. So yeah, that's cool. Yep. What was your favorite place that you got to visit while you were in Europe? Then ooh, um, I I like a cup. I mean, I like. It's hard to describe or pick because there's so many good places. There's so much history there. Um, I love Barcelona. I love. Uh, we went to Stockholm, Sweden. Nice, super awesome. Um, and then Germany is just awesome too. Like going into the Alps and Munich area, and but you go to Oktoberfest. No, we didn't make it there, unfortunately. I have a bunch oh, of friends that shit, went. The shit show there. You probably like, damn, there's so many Americans, dude. We went oh, one yeah. year, but it was like, I guess a good experience, though. But like you like you said, dude, there's so, just so much history over there. It's hard to yeah. pick. Because everything's so different, but everything's so cool at the same time. Yeah. Dude, so I'm glad well, it's you been around to- for, you know, five times as long as the United States. So like oh, anything yeah. history-wise in the U.S. kind of started in 1700s. I mean, there's – I was – Going in castles that were built in the 1400s, like yeah, you can't go <laughs> wrong with that. All, all of old buildings and shit like that. Only yep. thing that sucks really about Europe is not a lot of people have air conditioning. Yeah, yeah, we didn't have AC in the uh, in England, so those uh, those summer days where it's like 90, which is hot there, uh, it was it was pretty brutal. Yeah, where were you? What was the base? In, what's the base in England called? I, I, I'm drunk. Uh, we were at I was at Mildon Hall. Which is also right next to uh, Lake and Heath. Okay. Cool. I mean, they're literally five minutes away. How was London? You got to go to how far were you oh, from yeah. London? Uh, about an hour and hour and a half, hour forty five. So we would like drive to the furthest uh, tube station and take the tube in. Um, but it's super cool. I like it better. I like it better than New York, but it's pretty much a shorter New York City. Like you have everything there. Um, Got all the sports there. There's so many football teams there. Um, and then the food is just phenomenal there, too. So New York's going downhill, bro. I mean, not that hard to beat New York nowadays, dude. The New York's yeah, going man. down, dude. Everyone's I, uh, leaving, bro. They're all coming to Florida. Yeah, we're, we're I know. They, that, need, 
let me stay. Like there's too many. <laughs> so you went. So you did. You did England. Then would you? Did you come on orders to some yeah, go man. somewhere stateside, or what'd you do yeah. next? So that's when uh, I ended up at Herbert Field at the Red Horse unit there, and then I uh, spent my last two years there before I got out. And from from Herbert Field, you end up going to you got deployed to Africa, and that's where yep. we met at, right? Yep. And then How was uh, that for you. Uh, the point it, it was rough. Um, I mean, the only other deployment I did before that was to, um, UAE and Qatar. So it's kind of not really a deployment kind of thing. And it was only for like two months. I, I was a fill in for someone that, uh, got hurt. So I, they just kind of sent me on two days notice. Hey, by the way, you're going to, uh, you're filling in for this guy's deployment that he had to come back home. I'm like, oh, fantastic. How, how long what, How long of a notice did they give you for that? Uh, about a week. Damn. <laughs> and it was right before Thanksgiving. And, uh, yeah, so I was missing Christmas. My parents were coming into town, like, in the beginning of January. So I missed that. It's like, oh, fantastic. You know, great timing. What would you oh, say about that one? I actually, I we were supposed to go to Norway. I had tickets booked for my wife's birthday in Norway and we were going to go. And obviously I missed that. So, uh, yeah, it wasn't fun, but it happens. We got through it, uh, came back and went on another trip anyway. So Norway, man, you got to go see them Northern lights and them forward, I know. forward the mountains. It looks beautiful over there, man. Yeah. It's awesome up there. Like, I mean, we were close in Sweden, so it's kind of probably similar to that. What I think, True. but yeah, I would have loved to go there, but it just never happened. <laughs> so you just got to sell a couple more roofs, bro. You get that all, all paid for trip, man. Get over there. Yeah, I know. Man, dude. So, so you did UAE, you did Qatar, which is which is way nicer than what we had to do in Africa. We know oh, all yeah. that. So, we met in Agadez, AD two hundred one, and you guys were pretty much tasked with like building yeah. like the the brand new runway for the drones yeah. and all type of stuff over there. Um, Finishing the runway, doing the uh, the hangers, a couple more of those, yeah. You guys were working like nonstop day and night. You guys had shifts going. So like yeah. talk a little bit about that, um, you know, because you said you did the CE when you're uh, uh, in stateside, Min Minnenhall and, and stateside. Oh, yeah. And then you like turn on a whole different uh, channel pretty much. And you guys are just going balls to the wall. Like yeah. um, what, what helped you get through it? You know, when you're in, in Africa and like, you know, looking back on it now, what would you have done differently, if anything, just to, you know, get through that that tough time? Um, I guess what got through is just, uh, I don't know, you, you know, it's going to end at some point. So you just have to like, there's nothing you can do. You can't go home. You can't, uh, you know, there's no way to get out of it pretty much. So, I mean, you try to make the best of it as you can, even if you're struggling with that job kind of thing. Cause I mean, I wasn't the biggest fan of the job, but I kind of just kept my nose down, just kept going forward and, tried to work in the equipment as much as possible rather than outside and, you know, shoveling and stuff. Cause yeah. using the equipment's a lot easier on the back and a little bit more comfortable. So, um, just trying to grind, grind through and get the, like get through the day, go work out, relieve some stress. And that's about all you can really do. What, uh, what was your favorite piece of equipment driving over there? Would you like to do? Um, I'll tell you which one I don't want to do is the dozer, the bulldozer. Why not? That thing is rough. Well, A, you know, they don't send you with the, the greatest equipment first off. So there's no AC. <laughs> we were working at night. You can hardly see. Um, and then there's so much dust everywhere just gets in there. So, but as soon as you like move the blade and you hit a bump, like you feel it. There's no shocks. There's no nothing. It's just a hard, just, hit right on the back right on you know the neck like it just not fun but um i i kind of like using the grater um and then obviously like the loader the loader's the easiest one so loading up all the backfill throwing it into the dump trucks and operating that's pretty easy so 
Do you have to rank up on that, like, as you go up through the Air Force ranks? Like, do, like, uh, lower enlisted airmen get to do the equipment as well as, like, equal opportunity? Or do you just, like, yeah. okay, I'm an NCO now, now you can start getting trained on the loader or something like that? How does that work? So, like, when you first get to your base as, a like, a new airman, they try and get you in all the equipment and try to give you some time in it and whatnot. But a lot of the bases, they don't have that equipment. So, uh, obviously, you you learned it in tech school, you know, for the three months that we were there and you do like a week off pretty much on each equipment. And yeah. um, so you kind of just try to take back what you learned, you know, years ago at tech school to try to operate the, uh, the dozer <laughs> or the grader or something. And, uh, but you kind of just get a feel for it again. Um, obviously they try to get, you know, the airmen as much stick time as possible to get them more comfortable and be able to uh, be able to trust them to actually use the equipment and do it right kind of thing. Um, and, but if we were on like a time crunch, then like they would have the better operators kind of run the, the right equipment that they're better at to try to get everything done faster. Okay. So when you were getting ready to leave Africa, how many years did you have in uh, the Air Force and were you already planning your exit or was that still something that hasn't came up on the horizon yet? No. So I was in, so I got to the base, I got to Herbert in 2018, December, 2018. Okay. And then actually they notified me, you know, a month later <laughs> in January saying that I was deploying in March. So Damn. Yeah, I didn't even have my household goods or nothing. So me and my wife, we we moved up to an apartment up there. Didn't even have our stuff. We were still on an air mattress. And at that point, we're obviously, you know, uh, you don't really get paid that much to go to Africa. That's not tax free. Uh, I think right. the podium was what two dollars seventy five cents a day. Like, Damn. yeah, wasn't making anything. So the only way that for us to actually make money is she actually went home to Tampa and kind of lived with her parents. We put all my stuff in storage. So she lived down there for seven months and obviously collected the BAH kind of thing. I'll but two dollars and seventeen cents a day. Yeah, that BAH, too. Right? Like, yeah, fuck, yeah. Uh, but I mean, that was the only way that we were making money because obviously we wouldn't be able to survive just on the her paying rent up there, being by herself. So, um, so what's that? So then I was in what, four, three years, four years. And, um, actually on that deployment is kind of where I decided like, Hey, like I need to cross train. And, um, I was going to school at the time too. So I did do some schooling while I was deployed. Uh, I think I knocked out like four or five classes while I was there, um, using the, um, uh, tuition, TA tuition assistance. Okay. Um, so you so you're pretty much gonna cross train and stay in at that point, yeah. kind of thinking about just getting into a different job field and yep. just you know still making an career. <laughs> what what uh what changed your mind for you just saying you know what I'm gonna get out? Um, so I knew like not having uh her daughter there was kind of taking a toll and being apart and obviously missing all that time of her growing up and stuff. So um, I just made the decision to, you know, take care of my family first and, you know, I'll, I'll figure it out on the outside. Um, I didn't know anything about getting disability at all or anything, how much that would be, but I knew, I know a lot of people back down here in Tampa that have a variety of jobs. I knew I'd be able to figure something out. So, uh, that's when I was like, yeah, let's, let's just, I'm not going to stay in. We'll just get out and start our new life again over in Tampa. So I mean, respect to you for, you know, taking your family <laughs> and your wife and your daughter into consideration because yeah. some people might not even be able to do that, man. But you know, there's always, everyone's always going to get out the military. So you're going to have to make something happen regardless if you did 20 years or, or two, two years. So yeah. what, um, what did your plan of exit look like? You know, obviously, like you said, you're going to like just come back to Tampa and stuff like that. But like, how much time did you have left? And did you did you learn about the disability while you were still in? Because, I mean, don't be ashamed, bro. We're both 100 yeah. percent in here today. Yeah. So like we, we didn't know it at first. But yeah. like, shit, man, that's a life changer. So like, talk oh, about yeah, for sure. Up. Yeah. So um, once I got back from the deployment, that's kind of where I made, made my decision to uh, that I think I was going to get out or maybe it took a couple more months. Um, cause I knew that reenlistment was kind of coming up and 
uh, I made the decision to get out and I, uh, I actually looked at, I did the skill bridge program, which is a good program to try and get an internship. Um, which I ended up getting it down in Tampa with the company. So for my last six months of being in, you know, I did an internship with a construction company down here and, uh, that actually didn't work out at all, but, um, I didn't really have, it didn't seem like the company was really that interested in trying to make me like a superintendent or anything like that. It kind of just gave me like the low level jobs to do of, uh, documenting like our, the truckloads of materials coming in and out. Like, like I, I could do this easy. Like, why is this my only job? Like, are, do you have any interest of wanting to keep me later on? And it just didn't seem like it was working out. So, um, but yeah, the disability thing, I didn't know really much about it. Um, cause I never really talked. I didn't know what I would get. I just was hoping for the best. Maybe I'd get 10, 20%. I don't know. Um, yeah. but then I went to the guy at Herbert for the VA that ends up sending everything and then came back and, you know, I kept seeing deposits in my, my account. I'm like, what is this? And then I finally got a letter saying, oh yeah, by the way, you're, uh, you're approved for 70% disability. And, uh, um, how'd, how'd you feel when you got that going? Um, so I, I was ecstatic. I'm like, Hey, I'm getting something. I'm, this is more than I thought. And then, um, just being out in, you know, I see a few people like with the DV tags and everything like that. And while I was in, uh, the construction manager, I was talking to a guy that was moving in, um, that were doing the final walkthrough uh, at Lennar homes. And I was just talking to him. He's like, yeah, you know, I was at 70% and I went to, uh, this lady and they got it bumped up to a hundred. And I was like, and then everyone keeps saying like, Hey, like you did your time, you earned it. Your, you know, your back's all messed up. Your sleep's all messed up. Like, you know, you did your time, you deserve something. And like having multiple people tell me like, Hey, like, you should actually get it, try to get it bumped up to a hundred. Cause I'm one of those people that's like, eh, you know, give it to the other people that need it more kind of thing. Um, yeah. um, but so I just decided to go with them and they got it bumped up and here we are <laughs> for real, dude. Like, I mean, that shit's, that's life changing <laughs> though, dude. Like I, mean, yeah. I, I did the same thing as you, I got out, and you know just work my way up in increments at least you got 70 i was more yeah. stubborn and, and uh ignorant to the fact of going to the va appointment i didn't even go while i was still on, on active duty and that's one yeah. thing i always like to bring up is like dude just go before you get out because yeah, when you get out sure. and you, you're working at lennar homes and you're gonna say dude i'm working fucking 70 hours a week how am i going to go to the va i gotta make money and that's everyone's bullshit excuse and yeah. you're not making time for yourself you're making time yeah. to live and like make ends meet or whatever but like yeah. not taking care of your disability beforehand you're going to do oh, yeah. yourself and your family a, a way better service than if you wait longer, you know, and, and sure. you mentioned something about let the other people have it. We all can have it, dude. You're not taking yeah. away from nobody. You yeah. know, a lot of people love to say that shit. We all yeah. know people that love it. Oh man. We, well, I don't deserve it. No, we all deserve it, dude. We all, yeah. we all, we all sacrifice our lives. So yeah, good for you. I'm glad you got it, dude. And I'm sure it's changing you, your life and your family's life for the better. It's not, it's nothing yeah. bad nothing to be ashamed about dude. So, yeah. um, how did you learn about the skill bridge program, dude? Was that something that like your leadership brought up? Was it something you found yourself and you got into and, and made happen? Cause that's kind of cool. Six months you get to go somewhere, even though yep. it didn't work out, at least you didn't have to go. You yeah. Know, you got to I didn't have to somewhere. report into a duty station. Like I didn't yeah. have to do any, I, I was literally pretty much living a civilian life for the last six, six months of my, my contract. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think, I, th I think one of my, one of the E fives or E sixes or something had mentioned something about it. Um, cool. Or a so couple of the people that yeah, leadership in your year a little bit. Yeah. A couple of them were like kind of getting out to or retiring and talking about doing the skill bridge thing. And then I, uh, well, of course I took the opportunity cause I knew you'd be kind of out, but still getting paid. Um, and then hopefully it gave me a chance to, you know, get a job while I'm out. Um, so yeah, I just went to the education office and then they started giving me, 
all the information and then you kind of go from there. I think it's changed a little bit now that like it used to be you could pretty much choose any job you want. Like it didn't matter. Um, but I think that some people were abusing it and they've cracked down. And now like the company has to be like on their list of um, like approved places you can do it at. Um, but still the same process. You have to talk with a company that you're actually going to be doing it for, make sure they're okay with it. Like it's a free internship. You would think that people would jump to it, but, um, and then you just have to get everything approved and obviously do it, um, in the right amount of time, uh, not too close. Like you pretty much need to start doing it from a year out from your, uh, separation, data separation, maybe even a little bit further. Um, because the process takes a while to get all the signatures and then it has to go routed up through your chain of command and then to the education office. And so it takes a little bit of time, but once you actually get approved, then you're kind of good to go and you start working on out processing from there. What was uh, like the, the biggest road bump of uh, transition? What would you say while you were going through it? Anything or was it kind of smooth for you? Um, Luckily, for me, I thought it was actually all kind of smooth. Um, I guess the hardest part of um, the hardest part was probably like out processing because it was kind of during COVID. So a lot of places were shut down. You can only go for like a specific, specific time frame. They're closed a lot. And, um, but that'd be the hardest thing. I think uh, I had, we were already like looking at homes, knowing that we were going to be moving back down there. So uh, we actually bought the home like right as I was starting the internship. So um, everything kind of like just took its place and we were able to just move into home. And then like two days later, I started going to the uh, skill bridge, the internship. And um, but yeah, and then obviously going through VA, like trying to get the disability bumped up. You have to go to a bunch of different visits and um, I don't know. It just, it that's probably suck when you're going through it, but like, dude, it all pays yeah. off. Like, oh yeah. You know, for sure. I got to go to this appointment. got to do this, got to do that. Yeah. It's a pain in the ass, but like it all, it all pays off in the end. Right. You think, yeah. And I had to go to the VA appointments while I was still in, um, but they were all the way in like, crystal river and then i had to oh, drive damn. to the villages like nothing was just damn. like in i'd be like hey here just go to the eye doctor here uh, like i had to go out oh, to really? madeira beach for the eye eye doctor like i was driving all around the state damn. just to get that oh, done you're getting, you're getting like uh you were getting out to like community care where you had to go on a civilian provider you weren't going like yeah. oh here go to bay pines and st peter yeah. or, hey go to go to tampa va hospital which they have both of those yeah. like, the bay pines is a regional yeah. facility for you this area that's crazy so you were yeah. you were tracking the miles man but yeah. hey good for you to stay with I mean, it dude you, you could have said yeah. man i'm not going to that fucking appointment but yeah. hey good for you dude like yeah so uh so you use your va loan for your house yep use a va loan which is nice um i mean it's the easiest one obviously you don't have to really put much money down at all uh yeah. we i mean we ended up purchasing like a brand new home so it's being built um up until that november of when we moved in in 2020 and um my buddy he actually does uh the real estate for lenar home so we kind of got into there before i even knew i was even going to work with them but uh um so he kind of helped me with the whole process of getting everything done everything was pretty smooth and got to do a new home and so far nothing too crazy of issue wise, but yeah, just the pretty much zero down on a VA loan is incredible because a lot of people have 20, 30 grand grand to just, you know, fork down for a down payment kind of thing. For real. Now you're probably need like 50 or 80 grand for the same house because it's got the market. Oh yeah. Right time. Got a good interest rate and you know, you're up now. So good for you. What, um, so you said you started going to flight school. Did you use your GI bill for that? So I was planning on once I quit Lennar, like I knew I didn't want to do that anymore. So, you know, I was going to softball tournaments and a lot of them I had to, you know, fly. And uh, like last three tournaments that I went to before that, 
I kept getting canceled all the time. And it's like, well, cause there's a shortage of pilots, blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know what? I could, I could do that. So, um, I looked into a flight school, started going to that and the GI bill will pay for some of it, but you have to obviously like enroll in school. Now I had already just graduated from college. So I was like, well, I don't really want to take other classes to learn how to fly. Like, it's just like flight school is, pr it's different than like a regular school. Like you're pretty much, you learn about it and then you go fly and you go do it up in the air. It's not like right. you have to learn about the history of it or, I mean, you kind of do, but, um, but the GI bill will only pay after you get your, um, your like personal, your private license. So wait, is it private? No, it's, yeah your private pilot's license so that's like your first 40 hours is typically how long it takes and then after that once you start working on like your instrument rating um and everything else that's when the gi bill would start to kick in but uh i was scheduled three four times a week from december to like march and i just kept getting canceled i kept like the weather was too bad um so i was just sitting there you know i didn't have a job at the time and I was just kind of sitting there losing money, especially the days that you're not uh, flying because you get canceled. So right. like I got halfway through, I had like 22 hours. I only flew like 12 times from December to March. Okay. And uh, I was just like, you know what? This ain't, this isn't sustainable. I can't really do this. I need to figure out something else. So um, one of the guys, uh, one of my good buddies, He's been in roofing and uh, his buddy that got him onto it is starting a business. And I ended up joining up with them because they just started last year. So. So you pretty much about to just start flying yourself to softball tournaments. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. But, you know, I'm just right up on you to be you. like, you know what? I got this. <laughs> Hey, I'm about to get on. Get me on the team, dude. I'm right down the street, man. I'll meet you at the airfield, bro. Let's yeah. go, dude. Like, shit. What, um. Would you fly in like Cessnas? Like, yeah, a little Cessna. How'd you yeah. like it? I loved it. It was awesome. Um, I again like being pretty good at things. She, the my flight instructor, was like, "Yeah, you're probably like you're the top three of my students of like being able to fly, doing all the maneuvers and everything." And I never made it to the part of like taking the final test at all or anything, yeah. but. I mean, I loved it. I enjoyed it. And I like being in control. So like just sitting in the back of a plane kind of it's like, oh, I don't know what's going on kind of thing. Whereas like you're actually flying and it's like, oh, just, you know, turbulence isn't anything really. It's like a little speed bump kind of thing. And uh, you just being able to control it, like I felt more comfortable. No, I got you on that. Did you ever think you were going to fly before in your life? Is something you always wanted to do, be a pilot, or just something you came up with? Nope. Just when yeah. the softball was kept canceling your flights. So you know what, man? Yeah. I'm, about to, I'm about to take over. No, they get paid well. They can travel. And I was like, I'm pretty good at, you know, learning things. So let's give it a shot. <laughs> dude, I know where the perfect job would be for you, bro. You go right back to Niger, man. They got an air in Niger, dude. I got to tell you this story real quick. So oh, I have, like, I went to, we went, you know, you fl I flew like Turkish air. They lost my uh, bags when I first got to Miami and I was yeah. like sitting in the grand hotel to wait. I got my bags like a week later, dude. And then you're like, Oh, air Niger. I'm like, Holy shit. I got the first class. I have like the a seat, right? A, yeah, like, yeah. Seat one a or whatever, dude. I kid you not, bro. I get on the thing. They get you on the bus. They put you on the air Niger. There's no assigned seats. And they only have they only have one plane for the whole air, for the whole airline. Bro. Airline, they had, yeah. They, they had they had animals on the plane. They had all type. Bro, I thought I was gonna die. I I needed to fly my own. I needed to fly my own plane that day, bro. But did you did you guys ever fly on the Air Niger? Or did you just fly like C one thirties or C seventeen yeah. straight to uh like two hundred one? Just yeah, the military. So we yeah we did a military okay. flight Germany okay. and then flew down from there which you know you missed out bro they're they're, yeah. they're waiting for you dude go get your pilot license bro. you might not even need a pilot license over there just get yeah. over there yeah. can you fly yeah somewhat yeah good enough halfway you're good halfway through like dude yeah. I, did I, did I did 22 hours bro i'm good yeah like, yeah, um, yeah. yeah you get over there, dude. damn man but yeah that was that was that was probably the craziest flight of my life dude um but 
Yeah, dude. Good times. Good I mean, times. I don't know if that's much better than being in, in a C-130 with 120 other people crammed in there for a while. Yeah, that's true. That was probably my other Nine one. hours. Yeah, that was probably the other worst flight. Cause when I first <laughs> went to uh, Iraq, we flew from Kuwait in a C-130, like all your shit on. And it's October, but it still was like 120 degrees. Yeah. And it, yeah, like you said, jam-packed. And we got shot at. And I like they did a combat landing. So I was like, I already don't like high. I don't like roller coasters because I don't like none motion sickness. And now you're just like, I was, yep. yeah, my stomach's <laughs> in my throat. I'm holding on to the red cargo net. I get it's profusely sweating. I'm like, damn, dude, I'm about to die. Not even in country yet. Dude. Not but, even making it there. Not even there yet, dude. Like, damn. But yeah, you're yeah, you're right. Those are probably too close to the. And, and when I worked in Pakistan too, they uh, we actually flew on a Pakistani Air Force plane, and uh, like that was a, pretty much the same as being on a yeah. thirty, but at least not getting shot at. So yeah, true. Know, man. <laughs> so what's on the what's on your uh, horizon now? You got you. You said you're working for your buddies. Uh, what's the thing called? Is it Jack? Jack? Uh, I was trying yeah, to look so, it up before. Yeah, JAC roof. Uh, uh, well, geez, JAC builders of roofing. Shit, we gotta yeah. start getting some. We gonna have to start building some houses, man. Let's go. Yeah, whatever. I mean, we do work down in Sarasota area, so if there's ever anything down there, um, we give like two hundred fifty dollar referral fees. So, like, if someone actually okay. goes through with us, um, then we'll give you two hundred fifty bucks. So, um, Dude. that's for where do they find I mean, you at right on that? Where can they that? find you? My bad. I didn't mean to cut. I didn't mean to cut you off. My bad. I was gonna say, Wait. where can they? Where can someone find you on that? Um, just obviously they just. Search JAC, uh, roofing companies in Tampa. Uh, we're a local small family business. So um, we're not like one of the big, huge, um, like Citrus or Total Homes that are doing hundreds of roofs a week. You know, we're doing a, you know, a few a week, but we focus more on quality rather than quantity. So um, we have the best like actual roofers doing the jobs and everything. And um, we got five stars on Google, like, we're we're doing pretty well so um but yeah anywhere in the tampa area st pete spring hill lakeland sarasota we go anywhere within like an hour hour like an hour two hour radius that's not bad yeah Yeah. i'm gonna need you i'm gonna start building ab301 down here soon yeah hey we'll put some roof on there that's fine get your cessna get your landing strip get some red horse yeah fly some of the materials down there make it easy you know let's go dude let's go (laughs) what um what's one thing you miss most about the military um i guess like the camaraderie kind of thing you have different relationships relationships with people in the military compared to the ones on the outside um yeah. but luckily like i still play like military softball so like a lot of the guys i played softball with in the military like i'm still playing with them you know a few times a a, a year um yeah. so i mean i guess that's really the only because it was kind of nice being overseas in uh england and i was on the base softball team so we would for the long weekend, we'd fly to Italy, play in a tournament there, and then fly back. Like, yeah. that was kind of nice. Germany, Netherlands, uh, played in England. So, um, that was fun. And uh, probably the amount of, like, time off you get. Because, like, 30 days in the military, like, that's a lot. Like, you don't get that on the outside. Days. Four days, three days, dances. Yeah. You get all the so. weekend. I mean, depending on the job, you know, you get your weekends, your holidays, and all the, the you know, all that time off, and you're still getting paid. Whereas, like in the civilian world, you know, you got to take time off. You typically only get two weeks, depending on your job, kind of thing. So, um, I mean, that can be a struggle for people, but I don't know. I enjoy it. Um, luckily, with this roofing gig that i have you know i can kind of control my hours of how much time i want to put in uh you know i'm free to free to make as much as i want or as little um but uh yeah it ain't too too bad no night shift at i could do it yeah. I'm, I'm glad you got no, to do that uh 
the post softball, bro. When I got to Germany, I went to go try out, and they told me I could play with them. And then I was, I, you know, I was a cook. So, like, nah, man, we're not gonna be able to let you go. I'm like, you guys are yeah. bags, dude. To be honest with you, like, you don't, you don't like deny someone something like that. You're not telling. I'm not trying to say I'm gonna go sit at daycare or something. Like, yeah, you know, you gotta try out to actually get on the team, and they don't let just everybody on. But yeah, I'm exactly. You to do that, bro. I, I when I got to Germany. I knew I was ready to get out the military, but that's a whole nother story. But I'm I'm glad you got to do it because it's like, damn, you just travel and playing sports, bro. Like you do yeah. something that you love, you know. So that's cool. Yeah, that's what all my buddies would always give me shit. It's like, oh, you're really serving our country and playing softball and golf all over Europe and stuff. I'm like, I mean, yeah, someone's got to do it. Why not me? Someone's got to do it, bro. Someone's <laughs> got to represent the red, white, blue, man. Might, yeah, might exactly. Well do it, bro. Did you ever play against those like civilian teams that would come on tour, like the professional softball teams that literally just hit? home run every time up like um, i forget the names of them but they'd like come with all the bats and they'd be oh yeah, yeah yeah like oh my gosh dude those were those so, were wild. so in military softball there are like several players that actually play on the conference level and they're getting paid to play softball as well too oh, some wow. of them are still in the military um uh, obviously just depends on how much time they can get away from their job to be able to travel to those tournaments um okay. but yeah. this year my military softball team got invited to play in Barcelona Damn. and, and there's like team Canada is going to be there. There's a couple of like big name people that are going to be playing over there. And I think we're the only mil well, besides like the, the team from Germany, that's kind of local ish military. They'll come and play, but yeah, we're the only like stateside military team that got invited to that. So we're going there in March. Man, you better get the rest of them flying, uh, I, I know. Get me on, get me on the plane with you, bro. I'll be a bat boy or something. <laughs> I need to go and like sit with the cat and be like, just clock me in for some hours. You know, yeah, you can do all the flying. It's fine, but just keep writing them down. You know, something, dude. But no, nah, that's cool, man. So you up to big things? And I was going to mm -hmm. ask you, how's your wife like? You being at the military and just being able to be close to your daughter and everything like that all the time. Oh, yeah, I've been a pretty much game changer. Oh yeah, it's changed a lot. Like it's helped our relationship. Obviously, you know. There's like obviously being close to all the family and support that you have here down in Tampa because she's from Tampa. Um, yeah. I'm from Tampa. So all of her, her parents, her sisters, brother, uh, all of her family's here. So she has a huge like support system. Um, so it's definitely, I definitely made the right move, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, everything's going, going good. That's great. Hey, uh, one last thing I was going to ask you, what would you, what would you tell someone that's still in the military that's even yet to serve or may even be out struggling just about like the whole, dis what would, what would your advice be from you going through everything that you went through? What would your little pep talk to them be? Yeah. So, um, just, I would say just get everything documented. Like if any little thing hurts, go to the doctor. I was one of those people that like, I just tough it out. You know, if I'm, if I'm not feeling good, like I'm still going to go to work. I'm still going to go do it. If I'm hurting, like I'm just going to struggle through. I don't know. It's just the way I am. I do that in sports too. So like if I'm hurt, I'm still going to give it a hundred percent, you know, but just have to like kind of take your ego down a little bit and just get it, go, go to the doctor, get checked out. If it's something like, like headaches, if you, you're having trouble sleeping, you know, like any little thing, um, it'll definitely help you in the long run when you get out because um i had a bunch of leadership that was always telling me hey like make sure you take care of yourself on the way out like go get checked out for any little thing and i mean it paid off so now obviously you know i'm 100 percent disabled and um you know obviously you get in the benefits of that but um I've, it also i guess kind of depends on the job that you have too obviously you can't like not a lot of people are breaking their backs out there working kind of thing, but there's other sure. stuff that can be wrong with you. They can get checked out and it'll pay for it in the end. So. Absolutely. Now I appreciate you sharing that, man, but um, I'd like to open it up to you if we forgot anything. And I, I just want to say thanks again for coming on, sharing your story and staying in contact. You know, which yeah, man, it's been like, it's been years yeah, on end already since that 2019, dude, 2019 yeah. man. Like, but you know, we always stay in contact. I'm glad you're doing well. I'm glad your family's doing good. And I'm just right down the road from you. So yeah, hopefully we can sure. meet up in person. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to do some big things, man. So I'm gonna need your roofing, uh your yeah, roofing expertise in the in the future. But did we leave yeah. anything out that you wanted to add to the show? 
No, I just appreciate you having me. Hopefully, uh, you know, this reaches out to some people that are like in the process or, you know, getting ready to get out or if they need anything, you know, they can send me a Facebook message. My last name is Mazer, M-A-S-S-E-R. So uh, if anybody else has any questions, hopefully, you know, this helps and, you know, get everyone taken care of. Hopefully that's, uh, I mean, that's the goal of what we're doing here. So um, yeah. I'd love to help out anyone. If anyone needs to reach out for anything, needs anything, you know, home cooked meal, if they're struggling, talk to whatever they can let me know. So. All right. Appreciate you sharing that, man. If you guys listen to this uh, episode this long, we appreciate y'all listening in. Hopefully you guys got some good uh, input from Brett. I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing your, uh, your experience and your story. And hopefully you can uh, connect the dots for someone else that may be out there struggling. If you guys are in the military community and you want to come share your story, you know, come on, I'll have you on as many times as you want to get your message across because all our voices matter and, and uh, don't let ever let anyone tell you otherwise. And I hope you all have a blessed day. Until next time, take care of yourself and God bless. Take care. Yeah.